Welcome to Speak for Yourself. I'm Jason Whitlock. That is Marcellus Wiley, that dude. Coming up, we'll tell you if Derek Carr could be the next Raider shipped out of town. And if Steph Curry's already locked up another MVP award, especially after last night. But we start every day with a Whitlock. So what you got today, dog? All right, Colin Kaepernick, LeBron James, Malcolm Jenkins, Steve Kerr, woke athletes across America gather around. Hmm. I've got a story to tell you that your social justice warrior handlers won't. In broad daylight yesterday, a U.S. attorney misused the criminal justice system and convicted three men of bogus felony crimes for allegedly defrauding the NCAA system of exploitation called amateurism. James Gatto, Merle Cold, Christian Dawkins are facing federal prison time for the heinous crime of giving black kids and their families money for participating in a system that modern NCAA architect Walter Byers analogized to slavery. Don't get mad at me. Walter Byers, a white conservative man from Kansas, called the system he helped build in the 1950s a form of slavery in his 1995 memoir. NCAA amateurism is a sham. Everybody knows it. But Gatto, Cold, and Dawkins are headed to jail in the aftermath of the so-called Adidas trial. And here's who's next. Chuck Person, Lamont Evans, Emmanuel Richardson, and Tony Bland. Those are the next victims of U.S. Attorney Robert Kuzami's mission to protect the NCAA's corrupt system of amateurism. Here's what Kuzami had the audacity to say following yesterday's morally bankrupt convictions. Quote, today's convictions expose an underground culture of illicit payments, deception, and corruption in the world of college basketball. <clears throat> These defendants now stand convicted of not simply flouting the rules, but breaking the law for their own personal gain. As a jury has now found the defendants not only deceive universities in, into issuing scholarships under false pretenses, they deprive the universities of their economic rights and tarnished an ideal which makes college sports a beloved tradition by so many fans all over the world. Are you kidding me? This man had the gall to unload this pile of manure in 2018. Hmm. Deprive the universities of their economic rights? These kids and their families were paid at the behest of the people running the basketball programs at these schools because everyone working within the fraudulent NCAA system knows the system is fraudulent. These universities aren't victims. They're making billions of dollars off the backs of football and basketball players. And here are the guys going to jail to protect this outdated system. James Gatto, Merle Cold, Christian Dawkins, Lamont Evans, Chuck Person, Tony Bland, and Emmanuel Richardson. And here are the woke loudmouths who are definitely silent on the matter. Colin Kaepernick, Malcolm Jenkins, LeBron James, Steve Kerr, Greg Popovich, Eric Reed. What, Nike got their tongues tied? Their little fake Twitter leader hasn't told them to be emotional and upset about this abuse of criminal justice power? It's much easier to throw on an equality T-shirt and take a knee on issues outside your area of expertise than it is to clean up your own house. I'm embarrassed that the very athletes exploited by amateurism have nothing to say when the Harriet Tubmans of NCAA amateurism are going to jail. All right, joining the desk now are former Bengals wide receiver T.J. Husmanzada, Yahoo Sports writer Chris Haynes. Marcellus, I'll start with you. Why are we not in outrage and going off about this? Why are the athletes so silent as men go to jail over something this bogus? You brought it today, brother. Um, <laughs> agree or disagree, uh, you brought it. Wusa is, is, is the first thing I want to do just to, to break the tension. But um, I think that they are. I think these athletes, the ones that are outspoken in different causes, social injustice, uh, criminal reform, whatever you want to call the woke athlete, 
I think they are speaking out about this as well. Uh, I'll give you this... two... Yeah, I'll give you two examples. One, the LeBron James produced documentary student athlete uh, spoke about it. Did it land exactly where we desired? Did they come up with an economic plan that suffices? No, but they certainly are speaking about this. Two, just yesterday, which is not getting enough conversation and national attention, Rich Paul uh, actually talked about an internship for a student athlete who was supposed to go and play basketball at Syracuse, who's now going to be a New Balance intern to the tune of $1 million for three months. So what's happening right now, Willock? As you know from the debate team 101, the first thing they tell you is the best way to win an argument is to use their words against them. Now, Rich Paul, LeBron James are using the term student athlete against the NCAA. Hey, students get internships, don't they? Oh, you didn't know they get million dollar ones from New Balance? You're bad. So I think they are actually approaching this. Some of them, some of them are. Okay. LeBron James. Nibbling at the edges. <laughs> <laughs> this man going to jail. Nibbling. Yeah. Jail. Yeah. And ain't nobody saying nothing. Well, that's, that's where the hypocrisy lies in this whole situation is the fact that these head coaches, high-profile head coaches, they know the system. They know how everything works. And they've been getting away for it for a while. Chris, let me go. let me go one step higher. These school presidents yeah, agree, who yeah. run the NCAA, this is their system. The school presidents, they know what's going on, continue. But who's being indicted? The assistant coaches, the player development coaches. The, guy, the, 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 little, the little working underlings of these, um, these sneaker the hoppers on the, the street. Hopper, exactly. Mm, <laughs> Those individuals. Fire, huh? And so I, I will say this. I, I think for the most part, I think LeBron James, you mentioned the documentary, and Darius Baisley, the, the New Balance $1 million shoe deal he has going on as an internship skipping college for, for going that right. But I think one part that I think we don't think about enough is that for most players, they're so removed, talking professional players, and even these coaches, you mentioned, you mentioned Steve Kerr, they're so removed from college. It's, it's so far, it's like most of the time, it's the ones that's really talking about it are the ones who still are associated with these institutions or still or not too far removed from these colleges. I think they're just fighting battles that are within their rights and that's affecting them and their peers right now. I think they're talking about a lot of issues they're far removed from they're involved in the basketball world. They're involved in the athletic world. They have a lot of opinions about things outside their area of expertise. To me, this is the shoe companies pulling their little puppet strings. Hmm. Don't touch this. Don't touch this because, again, the same way Adidas just got in trouble, it could happen to Under Armour, Nike, or any of these other shoe companies. The, the problem I have is life isn't fair. And my mother had four kids. Only one of them graduated. Is that fair? No. We grew up on government cheese and the projects. Is that fair? No. If a kid is good enough to benefit because he has athletic talent, it shouldn't be a problem. It's a complete crime that the, the we call them runners. Yeah. The, if they don't get these kids to commit, they're going to lose their job. So by any means necessary, oh, you got 100000 Oh, if we can get this, they're going to do that. And it's not... For them to waste taxpayer money and even go to trial with this. Thank you. It's a waste of taxpayer money. The people that own the jury that convicted these men, what are they doing? Like, what are you doing? And they're convicting the wrong men. LeBron James didn't even go to college. For him to even say something about this is great. Yeah. Something needs to change about this because you got coaches that are making millions. Of, tell Nick Saban to go to uh, Ball State and win a national championship. He won't do it. If you don't have the players, you are not getting it done. But... but I, just, I don't want to demonize the coaches. Didn't mean to talk about your school, I'm sorry. No, 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 no I don't yeah. want to demonize <laughs> the coaches, though, because, and again, I put some blame on the coaches. But these universities and the people running the universities, the school presidents, they know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly how much money is being generated by football and basketball, and they take that money. And yeah, they pay Nick Saban well, but they spread that all around campus. Oh, yeah. Everybody eats off the backs of the football and basketball players, and, and, and we're sitting here in 2018 when everybody... Walter Byers invented this system. He perfected it. He said what it is, and we're sitting here, and there's a U.S. attorney somewhere putting people in jail over a system everybody knows is corrupt and unfair, and people are going to jail for this, and no one is yeah, upset. That, that... Okay, but let's get this corrected, and let's get this clear. 
Uh, the people who are going to jail weren't pure in intention. It doesn't they matter. They just were less corrupt. It doesn't oh, matter. Hold on, that does matter. No. It's no. Lost. They were less corrupt than the institutions, and you can say NCAA as a whole. But trust me, when you walk into a living room with someone who's been through poverty as you and I have, welfare, food stamps, government cheese, and you walk up to me and you know I'm one of those talents that is a one and done. Been broke 18 years, I will be rich in my 19th. But I got one year of a bridge, uh -huh. and you offer me 40000 80000 100000 when that's not fixing my issues, that's a temporary fix that could be a lifelong of problems for me and now for you. Do not come up to me acting like you're trying to save me, but when really you're trying is, to save yourself. But the point is, it shouldn't be a lifelong problem. I agree it with that. It should not be a lifelong... Anybody, any kid that grows up with nothing, 40 grand is like a million dollars. And that's 40, the short cut. You're like, hey, but, but it, it does fix some oh, things no, no, in, in no, that short term. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. What are you talking about? Hold on, what's your goal, first of all? Is your goal to make 40,000? No, 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 no
will force them to go to the table and try to implement some change. Oh, no. I think that what we're seeing is more so what Rich Paul talked Man, about. These... He's working with the shoe companies. Who's giving a million dollars for but, the internship? Okay, but... Uh-huh. You know let's, what's let's happening? Talk... He's using these the These dudes are possibly going to go to prison for nothing. That's true. For nothing. The That's the man, biggest thing. For the nothing. The rifleman deserves better. <laughs> the rifleman the deserves better. All Chuck of them first. deserve better. Uh, this is a, a sham. Uh, and it's an outrage, and, and I wish more athletes would lend their voice to it. All right, thanks, Chris. Thanks, TJ. All right, welcome back. One of Carr's teammates had an issue with that. All right, time for big stories. I'm Whitlock. He's Wiley. TJ Hushmanzada is back, and we're joined now by Fox NFL analyst Mark Slareth. Let's move to Oakland, where Derek Carr has had a rough year so far. Aside from his struggles on the field, Carr came under fire this week with reports surfacing of a fractured locker room made worse by the quarterback's alleged crying on the field. But some of his teammates are coming to his defense, with Jordy Nelson saying the team has faith in Carr and tight end Lee Smith venting about what was said on our show, on our show earlier this week. It's comical and laughable that I'm even sitting here talking about it. Um, us as players... Uh, have zero issue with Derek Carr. He is our leader. He's always been our leader. We put a C on his chest for a reason, along with Rodney Hudson. And uh, regardless of what face he makes after a tackle or, or uh, what everybody wants to dive into and, and wear him out about, uh, attacking his character or attacking him as a leader on this football team is a joke. My, my wife, because of how much she loves Derek, because my wife thanks Derek on a regular basis for helping me be a better man off the field, uh, based off of her love for Derek, she pulled up a video last night. Um, and it was Tony Gonzalez and uh, James Harrison and a couple other guys. And hell, they were talking about his religious beliefs and his political views and all kinds of crazy things that have no relevance inside our locker room and inside our brotherhood. All right, Marcel, I think we're the couple other guys. I'm gonna say, man, <laughs> yeah. Can we get some names and numbers? Can you respect our name? Look. <laughs> I think it's great what Lee Smith has done here. I think it's great what Jordy Nelson and a couple other teammates have said here. I'm not 1,000% convinced, though, that that entire locker room is on board with Derek Carr. I, I, I'm not, I think it's great what they've done, and some guys have rallied around him. But I think where there's all this smoke, there is probably a little fire. You just criticized him for not saying our names, and... I'm going to criticize you for not saying his wife, because she's the one that watches the show. <laughs> she's the one that brought it up. Respect to you, Miss Smith. Um, look, man, uh, I don't think there are too many locker rooms where you have uniformity, unless it's like Tom Brady or, you know, not even Aaron Rodgers. There's some guys in that locker yeah. room like, oh, um, yeah, the, let me not speak candidly about Aaron Rodgers. So very few guys have the entire congregation on their side. That said, I did text with a player, a black player, because I think some of the criticism is not enough players are supporting Derek Carr, and where are the brothers yep. in that support? And that black player said, we love him. We're all in for him. We feel bad for him out there right now because he is getting destroyed in the pocket. Uh, maybe that's why he did cry or not cry. Whatever it is, he's feeling the pain of no protection. So I, I'm with Lee Smith in the sense of uh, the noise that's out there that he shouldn't have to address it. But also, Lee, challenge to you. Don't address it. Uh, I, it's cleansing to me when you come to me with criticism. Every day I do this show, Whitlock, I get dozens of tweets. Some loving our show, some hating our show, and most of them hating you. They are like, oh, like and every other tweet, I'm trying to enjoy my Twitter day. And I'm like, and you know what I will never do? Defend you publicly, because one, you're a big enough dude to d deal with it and take it. Two. That, to me, feeds the fire that is actually going against you to burn you. I'm here to support you, and I know how good you are. I know how real you are. I'm not going to go out there for them who don't know you and try to defend it. It's cleansing when people who are on your side stick with you, and people who are not just say, let them go. Lee Smith, learn that lesson in life. Let them go. Yeah, I, I will tell you this. You know, it's really interesting. Um, having been doing this for 18 years, but for the first 16 being in studio and then being back calling games and being around football teams. And you know what it's done more than anything for me? It's reconnected me with the empathy that I have for this game. This game is hard, man. Mm -hmm. It is hard. And you take a flipping beating when you play this game. 
And I think the guys in that locker room understand where Derek Carr is. I know they, they understand the beating that he has taken. I understand the whole organization from an organizational standpoint. Like, I can't believe there's a lot of faith within the organization, the way the organization has taken their best player, their most character man, and shipped him to Chicago. Mm. I mean, I think, if anything, there's a lot of frustration with the organization more than there is Derek Carr. And, you know, guys will point in different directions, but I can't imagine them looking at the way he has played and what he has overcome and the broken leg and the different coordinators and all that stuff and not having your quarterbacks back. I, I, I just can't buy that. Uh, now there's going to be some guys that don't like him, whatever, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of dudes that I didn't want to pick out curtains with, right? <laughs> like, as long as you go out and play hard and stuff, I'm like, you, you do your thing over there and I'm going to do my thing over yep. here and we're going to be fine. Yep. For, for the most part, there's very few guys on the team that don't like the quarterback unless he's flat out terrible as a player and just a bad dude, a horrible person. He cried. If he did, or he, it's an emotion. Mm -hmm. The problem is we play football. You're not supposed to cry. I actually think it shows a lot in a man when you can cry in front of your peers. That's harder to do yes. than not to cry. It's really hard. If he did cry, who cares? Right. That's an emotion that he showed. Mm -hmm. And for him to come out and defend him, Lee Smith, like that, that's a good thing. That shows that, one, He's throwing me the ball, so I'm going to kind of kiss his butt a little bit so we stay cool. Man, so I ain't Jared Cook. Get the ball. ain't getting more catches off of that. And j just the fact, like, they're not winning. When, the, when you don't win, the quarterback takes a lot of the blame. When you do well, they get too much of the credit. It happens. Who cares if 100% of the team cares for Derek Carr? All right. As long as uh, John Gruden is there and Derek Carr is a quarterback, they better care for him or you're not going to be there. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Marcellus, I'm going to agree and disagree with your point about your tactic. And, and I say that this is going to be very arrogant. People won't think I'm cracking a joke, but I'm actually just being very serious. I don't need defense because my performance is spotless. Mm. And it has been since 1990, since I came out of college. Check my resume, go to Wikipedia, Google, whatever. My performance speaks for itself. Derek Carr is struggling. Mm. He needs his teammates to lift him up. If I ever have that kind of struggle, performance struggle, I would want you to publicly defend me. But as long as my performance is Google spotless, <laughs> I don't need no defense. Where? My work speaks for itself. Derek Carr's out here throwing interceptions, losing See, games, and right, things like yeah, that. Yeah, but I will, I will say this, football, and this is uh, what I love. Team sport. Right, that's Hold what I now. love about the game. And you can't do, you know, the thing I love about playing offensive line, you know what the thing I love about that is? Five guys from different parts of the country from different economic backgrounds come together and become one unit. And all five of us can be doing the wrong thing as long as all five of us are doing the wrong thing together. It's going to work. Yeah. It works. It is going to work. Yeah. But when two guys are going one way, one dude's doing one thing, and two other guys are going the other way, man, it is going to fall apart. And so we are interconnected, and we depend on one another to do our jobs. And right now, you know what? He's depending on the rest of that team to do their job and my coaching staff to do their job. And guess what? They failed him. All right, well, with Carr struggling and the Raiders in a fire sale mode, there's been a lot of speculation that the quarterback could be the next guy shipped out of town. Yesterday, John Gruden was asked if there were more trades in the team's future and didn't exactly slam the door on the idea. I don't see us making any more trades. I didn't see us making a trade the other day. I really didn't. But sometimes, like I said, uh, your plans change, whether you like it or not. You don't know who's going to call you and what they're going to say. You really don't. But I don't see us making any more trades, but I'll never say never again to anybody today. I don't see us making any more trades. Certainly, I don't see us trading our quarterback. Uh, and so uh, that, to me, gets me to the final point here. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think all the smoke around Derek Thomas, I mean, uh, Derek Carr, that's coming from John Gruden. Mm. He's fanning the flames because he wants Derek Carr to be tradable. Mm. And, and so I, I don't buy this. Well, unless someone makes an incredible offer, we're not trading Derek Carr. That's what I heard. And I think Derek Carr is on the trading block. And I think uh, John Gruden and his little minions are the people that have poisoned the well for him far more than any of his teammates talking about, about him. Totally agree with that. Uh, everything he just said contradicted everything he just said. You know, and he's <laughs> talking about, I don't see us trading him. I didn't see us trading Amari Cooper. So that means you just can't see because you did exactly <laughs> what you said you wouldn't do. He also said, uh, never say never, right? But I'm never going to trade him. 
So that never is nothing and is nullified because you don't know what's going to be offered for this same Derek Carr. You're right. And this is why a Belichick in the pros, a Nick Saban in college works. Why you keep it close to the vest, why you don't give them too much, because then you have the cards, you have the knowledge, you have the vantage point to make all moves. This is transparent. This is obvious. You're trying to say, hey, I got a little piñata out there. Take a swig at it. Take a little swap at it. Let's see what happens to it and see if some candy comes from it. See what other teams are saying. I'll give you two first-rounders for Derek Carr. That's all he's doing. And it's sad to see that he's using that kid in that, in that regard. <laughs> well, I mean, this is like the dreaded vote of confidence. You know, when, they, when, they give a, <laughs> when an owner gives a, co a coach a, the vote of confidence at the end of the season, and then like two weeks later he's gone. Like, no, I got nothing but complete faith in my head, coach. You know, you're out of here. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's what it feels like to me. But, I, I, you know, just from an organizational standpoint, guys, when you take the best player on your roster, the guy that by all accounts is one of the best humans on your roster, and a guy that earned that in your own organization, that did it the right way, that played the right way, that showed up every week, that through thick or thin, through good or bad, showed up and dominated the league, was all pro at not only linebacker, but at defensive end the same season, first guy that's ever done that, and you dump that guy because you don't want to pay him, you've sent a message to your whole locker room that doing it the right way doesn't matter here. Hmm. And when you send that message, man, I'm telling you what, every guy in that locker room is going, uh-huh, yeah. Whatever you say is in one, out the other, because you guys are all full of crap. That, that's locker room talk. Once you get rid of Khalil Mack, everybody's a, I don't plan on trading him. All he's saying is, somebody make me a competitive offer, and he, <laughs> right. he don't. Right, thank you. Like, how, how does Reggie McKenzie feel? The draft, you hope to draft Pro Bowl caliber players. You draft Khalil Mack, he gone. Mm. You draft Amari Cooper, he gone. Mm. He draft Derek Carr, he's good, he's gone. That's your job is to draft quality players. Reggie McKenzie has done that. John Gruden is coming in saying, nah, I don't want none of these dudes. Get them out of here. John Gruden, I hope it works out. I'm eager to see how these few years go because he's just giving away. You got a first-round pick for Amari Cooper. What you going to do, draft a receiver and hope he's as good as Amari? It makes no sense to me what he's doing. But he, all this, this whole press conference, please offer me something good for Derek Hart, <laughs> right. and he's gone. Sale tag. Right? All right, great job. Fox Sports has teamed up with USA Today and their social media news site for the win for the first ever Pro Football Fan Index. Last week's question was, which NFL team has the best touchdown celebrations? And the big winner, no surprise, was the Pittsburgh Steelers. This week, the question is, which NFL team has the best uniforms? Vote on Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag Fan Index plus the hashtag with the team name. For example, if you think the Rams have the best uniforms, just vote with the hashtags Fan Index and Rams. All right, welcome back. Whitlock and Wally here, and we're joined now by NFL insider, Fox NFL insider, Jay Glazier. Hey, hey, Let's I, talk I, some NFL. I, I, before we talk NFL, I just want yeah. America to really understand what I'm dealing with here with these two, okay? <laughs> so I go on the show before Colin Carroll, and I wear my MVP T-shirt and this. And then the producers here tell me, no, you got to dress up for these show. Producers, yeah. do you have any idea how filthy these two individuals are? <laughs> are you kidding me? Who are we dealing with here? We're trying to get you right. <laughs> Got a suited and booted. Oh up my here, God. Right? I've known these cats for a long yeah, time. Don't, don't, they are don't, don't fool the world. <laughs> don't live up to the insider label right now on that. You know too much. And you're thinking of Vegas with love. Oh this is Los yes. Angeles. Oh, Los is that Jay. what that is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I said Aaron J. We're going to talk about Aaron Rodgers here. <laughs> Aaron Rodgers takes on the undefeated Los Angeles Rams, yep. the best team in football. Mm -hmm. Any chance Rodgers and the Packers can hobble his way through some sort of upset? First of all, he should not have been playing the first six weeks of this year. I mean, the injury that he had, and we talked about this on Fox and Evolve Sunday, would have kept most people out six to eight weeks. He had a really deep bone bruise. He really got some bleeding going on in there. And an MCL injury... So the two of them, it's so painful. That's the type of injury that would keep most guys out a good two months or so. And guy missed, he didn't miss a full half, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's unreal. He's not, he's not for this planet. He's different. Uh -huh. he's, so can he beat the Rams? 
Guy can do anything he wants. He's just, he's different. We've seen it. Yeah. He'll need some help on the other side of the ball. Yeah, he certainly does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, a lot of help on the other side of the ball. Yeah. <laughs> We're able to self correct all the time, and he's found ways right. to go out there and still be Aaron Rodgers like despite this injury. Uh, remember that first down he ran for right. in the last game? And you're looking on. Yeah, how is he how doing? How can do that? Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, the thing also about Aaron and the way the Packers are is that they, you know, he, he improvises so much. It's almost like, like him and Roethlisberger have this thing where you go in there, once you kind of get the pack pocket to collapse and once you hit him, then a whole nother play starts. Mm. So I think that as the season goes on, after week eight, that's when you really, okay, him and his receivers will start to get a little bit more on the, on the same page. They'll start to understand, all right, when he goes this way and the pocket collapses and the play you know, collapses, we need to go over here. And that's when I think you see them getting hotter down the stretch. Let's go to a young quarterback in the league, uh, a tale of two seasons for Deshaun Watson and uh, the Houston Texans, losers of their first three games, but now winners of their last four games and in first place. Can Deshaun Watson sustain his level of play? Yeah, I mean, Deshaun Watson, what is your, first of all, um, this is a league of tough guys. I don't care what they say, right? It is a league of tough guys. He is about as tough as you can. Because we first had the, so we first broke this story two weeks ago on, on Fox NFL Sunday, and I'd say he's playing with a crack rib, bruised lung, and a partially collapsed lung. And Strahan was going, I couldn't even do the show like that. I mean, this guy's <laughs> playing like this. And then last week we report that they actually had to bust him to Jacksonville because of air pressure. They didn't want to put him on a plane. This is the type of cat you want leading your team. Absolutely. You want a guy like this going, oh, my God, talking about going above and beyond for us. He's doing that for us. Well, we got to lay it down for him. I think he's playing so well with these injuries. People need to keep that into account when they look at his statistics mm -hmm. and compare them to what he did last year right. and kind of electrify the league. This may be even more impressive what he's doing this year. It's not just, again, it's not just a crack rib. It's a bruised lung, a partially collapsed lung. It's, no. I mean, it's, it's how it hurts when you when you yell your cadence out. It hurts when you breathe. It hurts when you laugh. It hurts when you do anything. And he's just out there and he's telling people, I don't even notice the pain. He notices the pain. There's no way you can't. But yet he's doing what he has to do for the team. He's impressive, man. There's, he is the epitome, really. I, I think of where this league is going. You have guys like him and Patrick Mahomes and Baker Mayfield. Like the league has, has a bright future with these guys. All right, we've had James Harrison on the previous two days ask him a bunch of Le'Veon Bell questions. Everybody thought Le'Veon Bell was going to be back by now. Any chance this dude just sits out the entire season? Do you know when Le'Veon Bell's coming? Hmm. When? No, I'm asking you. Do you know when he's coming? <laughs> oh, I was about to say no. <laughs> no. Please tell me. So, and, and that's, I think, part of the, what has gotten the players so upset is that they were just like, you know, they keep getting told that they're gonna that he's gonna show up at one point and then he doesn't. And I, I did though report this week that they finally had talks last week. And what the talks were is that the once he comes back, the Steelers want to put him on a two week roster exemption list, which you normally do. You want to see what the player's health is, you want to see if he's okay, you want to see what the conditioning is. In camp, if a guy's not in shape, you could put him on pup list for a little while. Right. It's okay. You can't do that with him. So but during that two week period, they don't want to pay him. It's their right not to pay him. He has to agree to those terms before he then agrees to, si to agrees to sign his tender. Once he signs the tender, then he can come back and play. Now, just because they have him on that two-week roster exemption doesn't mean they can use all two weeks, but they can. So it's a whole different, mm. a, a whole different part here where they're both going to dig their heels in. Man, all that said, is he coming back this year? I, I can't answer. The, you I, can't. I think we all know because even when he says I'm coming back, like. Teammates were convinced, and they're talking to him. They thought he was showing up week one. It didn't happen. Then there was reports he was showing up in the bye week. It didn't happen. And then even if he wanted to come back at the end of the bye week last year, or last week, they closed the office for the weekend. So he couldn't have done that. And then they were convinced he's showing up Monday. It didn't happen. So I'm a reporter who likes to deal in fact. Yeah. So I can't tell you when he's coming because I don't want to be wrong. Well, I'm an analyst that likes to deal in an opinion. Okay. So guess what? Please What's tell me. What's your opinion? What's your opinion? No, no, no. I just said fact. I don't know. <laughs> Let me I ask no both idea. of y'all this question. Because yeah. as I'm sitting, if he sits out the whole year, the history on guys that have set out an entire season, I'm thinking of Sean Gilbert. That's what I'm thinking I'm of. I'm thinking of Dan Williams, I think, did it. He was a defensive lineman. Joey NFL Galloway, team. did he sit out the whole year with his franchise tenders and I know they eventually got traded? I know yeah, that Gilbert did, got they, paid. I think. Like, but it again, didn't hurt him. But I'm saying it didn't it help play. him on the field, though, is what true. I'm saying. True. If he sits out a whole year, could he be the same player coming back? I, well, you know, you have to look at it. It's like a guy tearing his ACL in camp. 
sits out a whole year. Can they be the same player? Yeah, they can. Yeah, they can, and, and he's not coming back from an injury. Um, the thing more so is, are you ever going to make up that $15 million bucks? Same. Even in whatever contract you have, you have to put an extra $15 million in for you to make that up. And that running back position, that's hard. Defensive end, not so hard. Mm-hmm. Quarterback, not so hard. Running back, very hard. Uh, let's, let's go to Giants and all their issues and recent trades. A lot of conversation is this team has given up on this season. So are the Giants tanking? No, no, no. I don't think they're tanking. I think the Giants have a lot of problems. And they had the second pick of the draft last year for a reason. They got issues in there. Okay? There's, there's culture issues in there. And everybody thought, well, we got a new coach. We got a great running back here. We've got a left tackle. All our problems will be solved. No. The problems that were happening in the last couple of years aren't suddenly going to disappear from that. And I think you see a lot of the antics that have gone on the last couple of years. They're not suddenly going away here with, with Pat Shermer. I think Pat's the right guy in there. Pat's a, Pat's a, he's a grown-up, okay? When there's been a lot of stuff in, in past teams, he's always been above the fray. That's what you want. But guys are so used to the culture in their last couple of years of carrying on on the sideline. It, it seems like every time now, a receiver and Eli don't mat, don't hit each other correctly. It's like a pity party out there. Everybody's doing this. They're throwing their hands. It's a pity party. They're all feeling so sorry for themselves, or they're so frustrated. It's like just play the, just play the damn game. So you're playing the culture card, not the quarterback change card. And some people are saying even the coaching. No, change, no, because you know? I, I think even if you had that, you still have other issues of when things aren't going well. There's going to be people hitting the. The nets and the bench <laughs> and the fan and the walking in. The bad culture. Walking yeah, in. And, yeah. hey, on the other side of the ball also, I mean, it's just the way, you know, they, the way they've all handled their business. There's been a lot of guys there in the last couple of years. Look at all the stuff that's happened. I think Eli's just shell-shocked from what happened last year. I don't think he ever recovered from what happened last year. Wow. Um, Mentally. Yeah, yeah, I don't think he ever did. I think he's just kind of still kind of shell-shocked from, from all of it. Um, I think he's being unfairly criticized, Jay. I think the criticism of Eli is too much. No one's talking about the other broader issues. Well, they are. The O-line? Yes. No, they're definitely talking about that. They're talking (laughs) about that also. There's there's a lot of issues, but my point is everybody just assumed we make three personnel moves and the entire culture in this place has changed. The energy in here has changed. It's not going to happen. You know, there's guys in the past here last year, the last two years, cornerbacks walking out, right, and getting suspended and leaving, and guys saying, well, we're just leaving practice, leaving meetings. I mean, uh, you know, Odell's quotes earlier, like the quotes that happened earlier this season, if that was the Strahan, Jumbo Elliott, Jesse Armstead, William Roberts teams, mm-hmm. right, Yeah, there'd be about six guys waiting in your locker for you. Mm-hmm. You just didn't do it. You didn't break that code. Today's cat's a little bit different in, in certain ways, and I think they see Odell do it, so they're like, okay, we could all do it also. It's got to be it's got to be about those 53 guys in there, man. It cannot be about one of them. doesn't matter Very quickly, how good Jay, we got to go. Does Patrick Peterson get traded? Nope, I don't no. think he does. Oh. I don't think – I think they, they've really – and that's – look, that's the thing. Raiders, here's the difference. Raiders, Khalil Mack, like, I'm not going there and I'm not playing there. And Gruden's like, okay, and uh, okay, he said he's not going to play here, so I might as well trade him. Patrick Peterson says I want out. Steve Kahn's like – you guys crazy? I'm not trading this guy. <laughs> and now, look, if somebody sends the most ridiculous offer, but he's like, I'm not trading this guy. And he's like, no, I'm not doing it. It's just, just because your kid throws a tantrum doesn't mean you need to give in to them and say, okay, you don't have to clean your room. You still got to clean your damn room. That's it. There you go. Thank you, Jay. All right. All right, we'll check you out later on Thursday Night Football. Yep. Returns tonight. Deshaun Watson and the Texans take on the Dolphins at All Starts at 730 Eastern on Fox, the NFL Network, and streaming on Prime Video. All right, welcome back to the show. Whitlock and Wiley here. The Red Sox are up 2-0 after another great game last night. We're joined now by Fox MLB analyst Nick Swisher. <laughs> no Fonzie jacket. Today. Today. Yeah, yeah. You better no take his jacket off. Oh, man, where's the Fonzie jacket? Boy, hey, man. <laughs> I think it was comfy, right? It looked good, but I thought I'd come, you know, a little more cash. All right. <laughs> you, you did get a nice haircut. I appreciate though. that, man. Thank you. I needed it. So, David, David Price delivered. That's yeah. two straight in a row. 
Is he worth the $200 million they get their money's worth? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know what? I think for what we're looking at right now is we're looking at a different David Price. And I think the transition and the change happened for him in the bullpen of game four in Houston, right? He was warm enough to come in. He didn't know if he was going to come in and close it out. Kimbrell was struggling a little bit. And he said something happened right there. Something changed. And from that point, the last two starts, man, he has been magical, man. Two consecutive wins after going 0-9 in his first 11. That's mm. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. The velocity is up. The command is up. His presence on the mound, at least to a viewer, looks like he's more confident than he ever has been, man. It's a lot of fun to watch him. I've been in that batter's box against him, and when he's on, you don't want to be that guy. Mm. Now, now all change is good change. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about David Ro Dave Roberts and his decision-making right now with yeah. the Dodgers. Uh, has he cost the Dodgers games? And yeah, I, I think that's going to be the biggest question that comes out. And obviously, the reason why we have jobs is being the Monday morning quarterback, you know? I feel like the moves and the decisions that he has made look good when they're on paper. But sometimes at the end of the day, you got to just roll with the boys that brought you, man. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you got to put your best players in and win or lose the series without them. We've talked about it so many times. Sabermetrics, analytics, they work in mass numbers, right? Short sample size doesn't work as well. How did they become the first team in World Series history in game one? to sit their top four home run hitters. Yeah. Not even yeah. let them give a chance yeah. at the play. Game two. Yeah. Game I know. Two. I, I, you got to remember, man, he just got done playing a huge chess match with the Milwaukee Brewers, man. Seven games where they were changing. The matchups were out of this. In the American League game, sometimes it's different. Sometimes you just got to let it play itself out because there's not as many changes, right? They haven't been the matchup team that they were in that NLCS. And I think when they come back here, they come back to L.A., I think they're going to warm up. They're going to thaw out. They didn't like being cold. But we're going to see where they stand. I want to stick with Dave Roberts, though, for a second because he's taking the heat. People are talking about he may get fired if they lose You're right. He does series. not have a contract. He's taking the heat. Some of this has to be an organizational decision. Absolutely. When you go with all right-handed lineup, take your biggest hitters right. out, that's not just the manager. There's people that spent money on those big hitters. Right that have to be signing off on. Oh, yes, sir. There's no doubt about it. If you think about it moving forward, the organization at the top, there, there's a reason why analytics are in the game. These guys have more decision process making than the other guys. If you're the Los Angeles Dodgers, you got to the World Series by playing a certain brand of baseball. All of a sudden, now, because they lose two games in a row and they're catching heat, why do you think they're going to change their style of play? Yeah, I feel like they need to shake it up a little bit, but at the core of who the Los Angeles Dodgers are, it's an analytic team, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think it gets exposed a little bit in the postseason, but just because they're down two games to nothing doesn't mean that the decisions he's making are not the right ones. They just haven't worked out for him. All right. Red Sox bullpen has been really dumb. Oh, Fire. Fire. nasty. Fire. Does that make this series basically over? It, it makes a difference than when it started. There's no doubt about that. I mean, the bullpen for Boston used to be a liability. Now it's an absolute weapon. And the way Alex Cora has used Nathan Evaldo or Evaldi as the, uh, the rover, the high leverage guy, he's using them in setup situations right now in the eighth inning. If you think about it last night, David Price went six innings. Then you face Joe Kelly for an inning throwing 100. Hmm. Then you face Nathan Evaldi throwing 100 for an inning. And then one of the game's best closers in Craig Kimbrell throwing 100. Your chances of winning, at least from experience, don't, don't work in your favor. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> you got Tomorrow, it, man. Tomorrow, brighten it up for you. Back. Bring the Fonzie jacket <laughs> okay, back. Okay, I'm going to bring something jokes. funky for you, you know? Yeah, All right. Check it out. Check All right. It out. The World Series we'll continues it. tomorrow night on Fox as Mookie Betts and the Red Sox look to take a commanding 3-0 series lead over the Dodgers. It's all tomorrow at 7.30 Eastern on Fox and the Fox Sports app. All right, welcome back. Whitlock and Wiley. We're joined once again by Yahoo Sports writer and NBA insider Chris Haynes. Let's move to the NBA, where Steph Curry dropped 51 points in just oh. three quarters last Ooh. night Ooh. as the Warriors routed the Wizards 144-122. At the moment, Curry's averaging 35 points per game, and the two-time MVP is already being asked about winning a third MVP. If you think about guys that have won three, it would definitely be special. It's something that I uh, never thought I had an opportunity to go after, but it's more so just on a nightly basis, staying within myself and doing what I need to do. And, again, those conversations will happen just like they did the first two times. And, and uh, I want to give you know, people a reason to, to notice what's going on for sure.
All right, look, we're just a week or two into the NBA season, but I think he is clearly the front runner for the MVP. I think the rule changes and the rule emphasis free things up. I, I, I think I said it yesterday. Yes, Steph is going to score 70, 80 points this year in a game. It's going to happen. The rules are dictating it. The rules favor Steph. He's going to win a third MVP. Uh, I don't think he's going to win it. Uh, look, he's the favorite right now, but we all know that the MVP award is a traveling trophy. Uh, if not, Jordan would have won it every single year. Uh, there were times we were like, Kobe, why isn't he winning it every single year? I never thought that, but go ahead. Okay, respect. <laughs> Whitlock has always been on the island. Now we have that verified. Uh, but look, there's going to be some Curry fatigue. Like, okay, we've seen this before. Is it going to do something different? And two, the more important reason, KD's on that team, bro. And look, KD has a brother by the name of Tony D. And Tony D gonna hit him, be like, hey, bro, go get your team back. Uh, uh, hey, bro, <laughs> you are an MVP yourself, two time finals MVP. Uh, there's gonna be a moment where that baton won't be solely in Steph Curry's hand. KD's gonna say, stick, if y'all know track, stick. Uh -huh. That means hand the baton <laughs> back, bro. My turn to go out there and give you 50 plus. So I think that shared experience is gonna hurt him. So you're saying that MVP award is a rolling stone? Mm -hmm. You know okay. what it is. You know what it is. Like Papa. <laughs> well, it depends on who Papa. Well. Not my Papa. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> but I, I will say this. I will say this. I, I think, first of all, it's a handful of games in. We're, we're talking MVP. That's just the nature of this business. But I will say this, Woodlock. Don't sleep on that guy in the East. Kawhi Leonard over there oh, in Toronto, yeah, he is what he's doing over there. Yeah, he's They're undefeated as well. But I will say this. I do think if Steph continues to put up these type of numbers, I don't think it's just, this is sustainable, but put up high amount of numbers, then I think the MVP war will favor him because KD is on that team. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of people felt like once KD came over, the MVP award would be vacant from Golden State during, that, during their stretch, during their run. Yeah. But if Steph can prove and show – that he is still the face, which we all know, still the face of that team, the most prolific player on that roster. I think the award goes to him. I, I don't think Steph's going to back up. I think he's going to average between 33 and 34 God, points a game a just because they're scoring so many points in the NBA. I think Marcellus makes a fascinating point. I don't know if it's the one you're making, but I'm just wondering – if Steph does win a third MVP and reemerges himself as the clear face of Golden State, does that make it more likely that Kevin Durant bounces or does it make it more likely he stays? I love you and I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I just heard you say uh, the point that Marcellus made. I don't know if you're making that point, Marcellus. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, I made that point. Uh, KD is not going to let this happen on his watch. And, and oh. it's not even in contention. It's not, you know, when you make a great point. Does he stay? I stay because I'm getting paid on my day off. Like, think about it. When he takes a night off, and that's not by effort. It's just by production. Steph goes for 51. He's like, we won. We did that. And then it's going to be my turn to do it. And Steph's like, all right, I'll give you 22. We won. We'll take that. That's how they won last year in a coasting effort. It was challenging in the playoffs, but that's just the formula for this team. And let's not act like we're new to the Steph Curry balling out of control conversation. Look at this full screen of who has the most 50-point games since 2012. James Harden, who we haven't brought up yet, but Steph Curry, six. So for the new rules changes that you're talking about, Whitlock, we respect those, but Steph Curry's been doing this. 50 in three quarters. In three quarters. Let's yeah. get those yeah. stats. Okay. Yeah. We ain't build that one yet. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of prep needed for this show. Yeah. Not all day. Does KD stay? No, does KD stay? If Steph reemerges as the clear face oh. MVP, I think it makes it more likely that KD leaves. Look, I, I don't know if that would make it likely, but I will say this. KD doesn't owe Golden State anything. He went there. He, he wasn't. It's not like he was in OKC. This is, a, this is the situation. I think knowing KD how I know him, he's a sensitive guy. And he will acknowledge and confirm that he's a sensitive guy. You know, he's getting tired of people saying he rolled on the coattails, even though he mm -hmm. was the reason why they did win those last two championships, finals MVP back-to-back. -back. But um, I, I do think he's going to want to challenge. I, I do think he's going to want to prove doubters wrong, that 
he can lead a team. It just wasn't the right cars in OKC. Why, why are you looking at me like that? Because you're not Look. keeping it consistent. Keep well, it why not? Say it with your chest. You said last week he going to the Knicks. Now, no, man, no, I didn't well, say that. I, 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 I listen, that. I actually I said, watch you I on said TV. the Knicks. <laughs> I said I'm the one. I'm the one that You're the only one. You didn't get that one dot, that rating. <laughs> I said the Knicks huh? will go after him. I said mm. I, I think he will give them some time as far as a meeting. Okay. But I didn't say he'll go there. Okay, but certainly you think next year, different uniform, just to prove I could be the one I guy. Think that's a I think Mar that's Marcellus a here, I, I think we're looking at a different NBA with these rules, and there's so much offensive freedom. If I'm Kevin Durant after I win a third title, mm. I'm like, man, let me go somewhere where I can enjoy all of this freedom because KD's a guy that if he had his own team uh -huh. <laughs> in, under these circumstances, he might average 40. Yeah. He, he might put up some really unprecedented Wilt Chamberlain-like numbers that would elevate his status. I think it would make sense for him to move on. All right, to a guy who's won four MVPs, LeBron James, LeBron James. who got his first win as a member of the Lakers last night <laughs> with L.A. dominating <laughs> the Phoenix Suns in a game where seven Lakers scored in double figures. Afterwards, Lance Stevenson said, that they had to get the W because Coach Luke Walton went off on the team during their pregame meeting. That, to me, is an interesting comment. Hmm. Yeah. That, to me, says that Luke Walton's feeling a little heat, mm -hmm. and he transferred that heat onto his own players. Mm -hmm. Exactly. As we know, uh, organizations don't fire the team. They fire <laughs> the coach. And Luke's like, look, um, them 0-4 coaches don't have jobs. <laughs> Do y'all remember Mike Brown when he came back to the hey. Lakers? What was that, his second season? They hey. started off 0-5. Yeah. Uh, he didn't get to 0-6. Hey. They were like, got to go, bro. Hey, and David, don't forget about David Black, number Black. one seed. Yeah. He's still out there. <laughs> they went got David off the seat. Look, watch LeBron <laughs> lands on your organization, and he lands on the organization. Uh -huh. They call it the LeBronomy, man. The, the economy the LeBronomy. Yeah, the economy changes with LeBron. Board. Don't steal that. <laughs> and so when he's there, there is pressure. Yeah, no doubt. Much is given, much is expected. LeBron has the ball, but Luke, you got to make it happen. And I think Luke felt it finally in that moment. He said, unleash, please, for he me. He definitely did feel it. I'm glad. But that's good analysis right there, Marcel. That's the finest thing you ever said today. <laughs> but I'll say this. You know, look look at the, the lineup change you made, too. What did I call it for? Hard. Yeah. I was calling for Josh Hart you to get up it. in that spot. Look, all right. And Luke, just a week ago, said, it's too early. It's too premature to talk about start line change. He's clearly feeling the heat. That's what LeBron James provides. He provides heat. It can be good. It can be bad. But it depends on certain people you ask. You ask Mike Brown. You ask David Blatt. You know, they'll probably say, some, say something otherwise. But, <laughs> look, this is going to be – I know it's a probably a, it's a, it's considered an evaluation year for the most part, but it's an evaluation year for the coach as well. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah. Primarily. Yeah. Because, again, LeBron ain't going anywhere, and all these pieces are pretty disposable. And, and so, yeah, I, I believe, like, LeBron was talking about patience, patience, patience after they started 0-3. Mm -hmm. But that may have been what he said publicly. Yeah. Looking at the way Luke Walton responded, it's like, LeBron might be saying that, but the way the organization feels, we, we can't be 0-4. We know these the schedule gets a lot rougher after Phoenix. They got a difficult stretch here, and I love the Josh Hart move. And then the other thing, I, I, I got to admit, and I got to go there, once again, my Lonzo boy, Ball. My boy, Lonzo. He, he my threw boy. up one scud missile air ball, but other than that. <laughs> he good for that. Other than that, Lonzo looked halfway decent. He's again. selling them shoes. Yeah. Ain't he selling them shoes? <laughs> I don't know if he's selling shoes. But if it's a game of Survivor, he's he's trying to he's survive. Old, hey, old. man, I'm unapologetic. Uh, <laughs> I love me some ball brand, big baller brand, man. And my boy oh, out there man. balling for these Lakers. Uh, I, I, I will go here. If you're Luke Walton, you have to stir it up any way you want to because do not get deluded by this whole conversation of patience. It doesn't exist. Mm. I've been on rebuilding teams, and I've been on teams that, hey, we were fully loaded, expected. Expectations are always the same because they're still printing money. They're still selling tickets, and fans are not just trying to see their hard earn money wasted. Mm -hmm. So you better go out there and ball. And I think that this Lakers team can do something this year. They're just trying to lower expectations. They ain't Internally, winning 54. They're, they're winning 50, though. Just think about this. He cussed the team out before playing the Phoenix Suns. <laughs> Says a lot. <laughs> Says a lot. <laughs> Says a whole lot. All right, thank All right, you, Chris. Man. All right, welcome back. Welcome to back to Speak for Yourself. Mm. 
Whitlock and Wiley here, and it's time for my favorite segment, Antisocial. Yeah, right. I get to take a dump on social media. Darnell Smith. <laughs> Don't you dare take a dump on social media. You some angel sauce. <laughs> Darnell Smith done went full-blown jersey yeah. the whole nine yards. Oh, look at him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you hokamaniacs out there. <laughs> oh, yeah, brother. <laughs> I see you, baby. Look good, Darnell. Don't hate Marcella. 20 inch pythons. I get you. Come on now. Yeah. yeah. Ball State, Ohio tonight. We could use you out there tonight, Darnell. I got about one, one more drive in me. That's it. <laughs> All right, what's happening out in them Twitter it. streets? Yeah, we're gonna start off in the NFL. Where the Pittsburgh Steelers are still waiting for Le'Veon Bell to come back, but one of his teammates just tried a creative way to get Bell the big money he's been out there with the Pittsburgh Reporter tweet on Tuesday. I just watched Juju Smith Schuster walk into the Southside Gecko and buy $120, $120 worth of Mega Millions tickets. <laughs> of course, the Southside. <laughs> right. Juju replied to the tweet with, Man, Le'Veon, I did my best for you. No luck, though. Mm. What do y'all think is more likely, Le'Veon return to the Steelers or win in the Lotto? <laughs> Ooh, that's wow. a good question. <laughs> Wow. But I got to be honest, I never play the lotto. Yeah, I'm with you. But my boys talk me into playing the lotto for this mega mill. 1.6 billion? Yeah. Mm. We bought 500 tickets and was very disappointed. Obviously, <laughs> y'all didn't win. Yeah, we did Look not win. <laughs> we bought them in the state of Arizona. But yeah, I, I'm with Juju. I had, I had to put my... Throw my hat in the ring for that one billion. You got suckered. <laughs> Everybody getting suckered. It's amazing. I had to tell my wife this. She went and bought like a hundred tickets. And I, I was don't like, blame baby, her. smart woman. So when it's at 23 million, you don't want to win that? You're like, why, why do we wait for us a billion dollars? It's like, all right, you know what? I gotta win a billion. I take 23 extra million right now, would you not? Let me tell you, your, you've seen and your wife have seen 23 million. We ain't seen a billion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take a thousand right now. <laughs> Boy, this show better rate. We gotta get that billion. We gotta get that billion. <laughs> All right, Darnell, what's next? Yeah, sticking with the NFL, it looks like Chad Johnson wants to reunite with former teammate Hall of Fame inductee Terrell Owens. Yesterday, he tweeted, quote, ESPN should let T.O. and I commentate for Monday Night Football one time. Would y'all like to see two of them calling a the game together? I, you know, I hate to say this, but, you know, it's like Jason Witten has kind of <laughs> lowered the bar. And so, <laughs> I would love to see T.O. and Chad Johnson. I, and I'm just saying. He's doing oh, a fine job. He, oh, he, he's Josh growing into the position. He's <laughs> growing into the position, and T.O. and... I'm not, I'm not letting you do this. We don't prepare the same notes, but we got the same notes. All right, this caught me off guard. All right, look, let's be re respectful. Jason Williams, my former teammate, I love him. He's a great guy. Maybe a little in over his head, and this is how I'm starting to realize this. Booger is getting all the shine in the Booger Mobile, the Booger Cam. He's dropping the nuggets. They're using him in sound bites, but more importantly, y'all see that commercial they have where they're all at camping? Yeah, in the yeah, tent? yeah. Jason Wynn doesn't even have a line in that commercial. I'm like, wait a minute. If <laughs> Lisa Salters is starring in it. Lisa Booger, Joe Tessler. Uh, anyway, I'm, okay. I got to get up. Yeah, but, but, but that I said, uh, I would like to see Chad and T.O. Um, yeah. in place of Jason. Let's just say it. You said it. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait a that would be entertaining. That would be entertaining. All right, moving on. What's next? All right, moving on to our guy, Chris Haynes. We all know that Biggie is considered to be one of the greatest rappers of all time, but yesterday, Chris took to Instagram to compare Biggie to Bo Jackson by saying, quote, an athlete doesn't go to the Hall of Fame if he only had two great seasons. Bo Jackson's never viewed as the greatest running back of all time, so why is Biggie deemed the greatest? Two albums? I'll wait. Mm. Do y'all agree with Chris's juicy take? Mm. Mm. Boy, it, this is your boy. I'm about to say, do we ever <laughs> want to go to New York again? This is your boy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Chris, come back. <laughs> I got some Twitter off. Hit him with it. Two albums ain't enough? I mean, <laughs> Jimi Hendrix, how many albums did he have? I don't yeah, yeah, I ain't into that. I will say this. Ooh. I don't think the best comparison is saying two athlete seasons uh, <laughs> because that, that second album was a double disc, so that's like three albums, right? Mm. Terrell Davis made the Hall of Fame, and he didn't have a ton of seasons because of the migraines and the injuries, but he still was a Hall of Famer. Biggie's trajectory was going so straight up to the heavens that you had to respect that this guy is one of the greatest all time. So I hear where he's going, but I don't agree with it. I, 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 I'm a Tupac guy, yeah. but I still bump Biggie. I'm going to. back to Cali as one of 
Woo. Anytime yeah. I want to get hyped. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come on yeah. now. Chris, well, love yeah, you to Chris. death, but Lord, woo. Give him half a bottle. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Who you talking to, man? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. He uh, had every athlete scared to go on a road trip after that song. <laughs> I'm telling you. They're like, man, I ain't leaving, dog. Biggie in the house. Right. Darnell, what's next? Yeah, moving on to a guy who's always making social media headlines, Colin Kaepernick, who tweeted out pictures of his new Nike icon tweet, or T, that is now available. The shirt is all black. It has his name on the back in reflective letters. Cap is getting a ton of support on social media with hundreds of people praising him for the shirt. Well, when are you guys be buying one of these? I won't. And, you know, I'm gonna... Everybody knows how I feel. This is... Actually, I thought this picture here, I thought this was perhaps the lampshade they were selling. If you oh, remember... Oh you remember it? See, he's... He's, he protected his image so he could sell lampshades. I, 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 I thought that's what this was, you but hey, more cool. power to him. Get that money, Cap! <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's weird, and this is not how I felt, but yeah. I, I learned from my athletic experience that we can't wear other people's jerseys. You know, like, uh, it's just a weird thing in the locker room, like, bro, you can't be wearing somebody else's jersey. You're supposed to be on that level. This is sweet. I like the, I like the design. I like Kaepernick's uh, design with this. I'm not buying it just because I don't wear Kobe jerseys. I don't wear... I just can't wear somebody else's jersey, man. It's just the way the game goes, so... Respect Get the it. money. So, Get that money. That's what it's right all now. about. It's... Let's go back to Witten. Soul brother number one. <laughs> Get that <laughs> money. Yeah, get all cap with that. That's his fresh. All right, person. Darnell, what's next? Yeah, last but not least, uh, TMZ Sports ran into your guy, Whitlock, Charlamagne the God. Uh-oh. Uh, and posted this yeah. short clip online. Uh, take a listen. Now, you are a Cowboys fan, right? Yes, sir. So I'm sure you pay attention I'm, to storylines. I'm a fan right? of the most racist... Racist owner in the whole league. Did you see that he brought the whole team to the African American Museum of Washington yesterday? yesterday? I did see that. Does that hurt him any points? Posturing. Nah, that's just all posturing. That's okay. all that is. That's just a way to appease his black players. Well, you guys did just give up a first round pick for Amari Cooper, Stupid. man. Stupid. Jerry Jones needs my book. I think Jerry Jones suffers from some form of mental illness. Uh, okay, fair. Be totally honest with you. <sighs> is Charlemagne out of line here? Completely out of line. He doesn't know any of the other NFL owners. To, to make some kind of statement like that about Jerry Jones and the kind of support Jerry Jones has given his black players, particularly when they've gotten into trouble, it's a ridiculous statement. He's the one pandering, uh, not Jerry Jones here. Jerry, love you to death. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I mean, one, I respect the hell out of Jerry Jones, too. Uh, he has Calvin Hill in his organization who was all about redemption for athletes, especially the black athlete, whether it was Des Bryant and having 24-7 surveillance with him just to assist him, Ezekiel Elliott and his defense. He gave me $5.2 I didn't do a damn thing for the Cowboys. I'm like, <laughs> if he ain't down for the cause, as sorry as I was. He's giving out money. Pay. Yeah, he just giving out money to brothers. So I can't go there with Charlemagne. Maybe I need to go back on the Breakfast Club and set him straight on this. Well, That's crazy. Uh, Come on, Charlemagne. I just Come wish on. we would just move beyond just calling people names that we don't yeah, know. Yeah, I'm with L that. Let's try to understand people and that. quit calling names. It's so petty. It's so yeah. shallow. Except when we talk about Witten, right? What? Because uh, we didn't call him no name. No, nah, we didn't. We no just said, you know, hey, the performance could be a little better. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we say. All right, today we're talking about Derek Carr, who has fallen far from his MVP caliber play a couple of seasons ago and is struggling big time this year. All right, I've got him at a role player level, uh, Marcellus, ooh, ooh. a total score of 63. I have him at 14 in job performance, uh, 24 in character, 23 in authenticity, uh, all-time greatness where he comes up really short. I got him at a two for a total of 63. High character guy, hasn't put his imprint on the NFL, not performing that well, role player. Yeah, uh, I, I echo a lot of what you said, especially on the field if you look at him. Uh, Ah, it's tough. Job performance 13. Uh, I, I keep it lower than uh, the average just because if you look at what Derek Carr was, it was like a great season and great promise and a great contract, but inconsistent play, whether it's been coaching changes or not, he hasn't lived up to it. All-time greatness, a nine. Like, he's, he's not forgettable, I, but he's not a two. I like, got to stop you here, Marcellus. I'm listening. How can you give this man a nine? What has he done? You're talking uh, about Kenny Stabler's uh, uh, team, mm -hmm. Rich Gannon's team, Jim Plunkett's team. Yeah. What 
How does he deserve a nine? Whitlock, I don't know if you know this about the NFL, but they're not just giving away money. Like, you got to do something to get some of that money. And this dude got a $100 million contract because he actually put in some work. Not enough work, but he's not forgettable. 20 years from now, we're at a sports bar. You eating all the wings. I'm just hydrating. <laughs> People going to know who Derek Carr is, and I think he's what still going to prove. Scott Mitchell got a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Matt Flynn got a lot of money. Yeah, and they also had moments, flashes, and he's had longer glimpses than those guys. Let's talk about the character. We're the same, pretty much. 25 and 24. Can't hate on him there. A family man, man of faith. Uh, really not stepped in it in any terms. Even crying is not something that you should debit a guy for. So respect to him. But on the field, that's the issue right there. He needs to get this stuff corrected and fast. I don't understand why every day we come up here, you're always 8 to 10 points higher than me. You have some strange discrepancy from me a nine in all-time greatness, this well, really bothers me. I don't know if you learned this lifelong lesson yeah. as a child, but uh, the glass is either half empty or it's half full. I'm an optimist, and you are not. And I can tell uh, every time you... I am you an optimist! Every time you text me before I read the text, I'm prepared for clouds. <laughs> I'm prepared for rainfall. And then I'm like, oh, he actually said something nice, finally. That's what Let you Let me are, tell you something, like. how optimistic and how nice I am.